the word you want? Uh, for the future, future chief now. Okay, now introducing Jackson Brown. He's a senior in our department, um, and we're excited to have him present his path to Michigan. And he's had many internships. Um, and so if any of you guys are younger and looking for advice on how to get all the offers, Jackson Brown's the man to go to. He won the Paper Plate Award last year for most likely to become, is it maybe? Uh, Chief Naval Architect. Chief Naval Architect. So that's how we view Jackson. Yeah, God help us with that. <laughs> all right. Um, I'm going to put that on there. I, don't know, I can talk pretty loud as you guys know. So uh, I don't know. Somebody made a big mistake and decided to pick me for uh, presenting my path to Michigan. So um, I'll I'll try not to put you guys to sleep, and I'll try not to fall asleep myself. Um, but it's, it's been known to happen. So um, and uh, I'm going out four hours of sleep here. But uh, so a little overview of this. Um, I'm gonna just talk about you know where I'm from, uh, early interests, how I ended up at Michigan, um, any you know uh, engineering related projects I've uh, that have kind of guided my path to Michigan, and then I'll do a path through Michigan, um, as fun as that was, and uh, discovering uh, this great department, and then I'll get into some cool uh, technical boat stuff and talk about uh, some internships, and then I'll talk about future plans, which there aren't really any future plans or I, I got to figure that out still so we'll, we'll go from there but uh, I'm from Dryden Michigan um it's about an hour and a half east of here uh up in the thumb it's kind of in the middle of nowhere I think the population of Dryden is like less than 2,000 and uh you know this is this is our house on Google Maps you know we got a little uh five acre plot um next to a, a lake here and I don't know if you guys can see this is like track from where the neighbors ride uh, dirt bikes on the ice in the wintertime. So you can get the kind of feel of the area. That's that's kind of where I'm from. Um, and I, I didn't go to Dryden uh, schools because they're a little bit jank. So I ended up going to the next town over um, in Alma. But I'll talk about that later. So this is me, uh, Baby Jackson, uh, right here. And uh, <laughs> here's my dad. Um, as you can see, I was interested in boats uh, at a young age um, as, as a very uh, uh, tough captain of a pontoon boat here. Um, I wish I got a better picture of this motor. This is a cool old, uh, like a, I think it's a uh, 70s Johnson outboard. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know how legal that was uh, doing, uh, having me drive that at that age, but uh, I was interested in boats and a lot of things mechanical. This is a Nova Scotia, that's the other tugboat. I think that was like a TV show back then. And uh, oh, fun fact about me um, I learned how to ride a dirt bike before I learned how to ride a bicycle, a pedal bike. So that was uh, that was interesting. It was like a little 50cc Yamaha with training, training wheels. It was kind of adorable. This isn't that Yamaha, this is something bigger. But uh, we, we, we liked our, uh, our mechanical, like power sports. But I um, also had a lot of interest in the marine industry. I don't know what it was called back then, but there was a way to. Uh, Get uh, it's now called, they have Duluth Harbor Cam. You can get like freighters coming in out of Duluth. They have them everywhere. They have ones in the St. Clair River. Um, it's fun to throw those up on um, in the background when there's like uh, high freighter traffic in the early or late navigation season. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever seen the Great Lakes pilots in the in the gas stations. I don't recommend buying those anymore because they're like three dollars now. But they're like newspapers that kind of. Uh, like dive deep into the folklore and uh, like of the Great Lakes and like they have a lot of good shipwreck stories, uh, maritime stories of these captains and uh, this is Francisco Morazan. This wrecked off of uh, Manitou Island and it's sticking out of the water in Lake Michigan. If you guys ever wanted to kayak to and walk on, it's pretty cool. But uh, and then I had, I, read, I had like this whole, whole library of like shipwreck books and I mean this a lot of this stuff is like I don't know Great Lakes diving guy. I got into diving. We'll talk about that later, but. I was, I really liked uh, boats as a young age, but um, I didn't really know that, you know, name was a thing. So um, I kind of gravitated away from that and getting into cars. Uh, once I got into high school, I bought this Mustang and it was super uh, rusty at the corner panels here. So what we did, we, we took a saw or um, cut off wheel and cut, cut the quarter panels off the old one and uh, took, took these new ones from the junkyard and welded them on. It was such a crazy process, but that's like the finished project. And I, I don't think it, too bad. Um, I haven't had it actually, but um, because I, I, I might have toasted the transmission in my <laughs> that's another story. But uh, I got involved with a lot of hands on projects, um, very early. Um, 
you know, uh, and of course I was into Legos and everything. I still am, um, but uh, they're getting too expensive now. So I'm starting to boycott Lego. But, uh, $800 for the Lego Titanic site, that was ridiculous. Then we ended up chucking it in the MHL. So that was uh, <laughs> money well spent. But, uh, so I went to high school, here's proof of it. Um, so <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I ran track and cross country. Um, I didn't really write, like running, but it was like the only thing I was good at because I had no coordination back then. Um, but uh, I was actually, my school wasn't that good. So I broke all the records at my school. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they were pretty bad. I, I was just, um, like, I was like probably medium statewide, but like at my school, I was like, I was like a star athlete, so that was pretty good for my ego. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I qualified for states um, four times uh, for cross country, so that was that was pretty cool. Um, and uh, this was before, like, I totally covered my because I don't know how you, if you guys know how cross country and track works, you get like almost medals for just showing up. So I covered this varsity jacket with medals, and it was like it was super heavy. I, don't know, I was always losing them too, but. It was like a bulletproof vest that was pretty awesome um but uh oh yeah i was also into nerdy stuff too i was in the band um but then i, I was drum major for two years because i so i could get out of marching and i could i also like being in charge um <laughs> but uh but i i played uh i played trumpet when i wasn't or before i was a drum major and i think down here this is nothing like uh John's uh, band. Um, this is like super small town, like very disorganized. But like our, our senior show was Western, so if you can see I'm, I'm wearing a cowboy hat there. Um, and I think I, I think they let me have a I had a holster and everything, so that was pretty cool. I got to be a cowboy. I'm in the Boy Scouts. This was uh, this was right before our trip to Philmont. If Brian's here, so that's a, a two week uh, hiking trek in New Mexico. Absolutely beautiful. Um, and uh, here's some more camping stuff in the boys' house. This is a winter camp out, looks like. Um, that was cold. And then here's proof that I graduated. Um, so yeah, there's my uh, dad, uh, Ken Brown. There's my mom, Jerry, and my sister Sarah. So that's uh, that's our family. I should, should mention them earlier. That's kind of important. But, uh, so yeah, I um I, I eventually had to like work to make money because to fund all my projects in high school and I had many like jobs. Um, I started out uh, kind of mowing lawns at first and uh, I just mow lawns for all the neighbors and they had like you know five to ten acre properties so it'd take forever and they'd pay they'd pay well. Um, and that's how I got this uh, nice gash on my head because I ran into a tree and uh, it, it was a good thing I was wearing sunglasses because I. Uh, pretty close to my eye there but uh um so i got mowing lawns i didn't like doing that anymore after that um and i got into uh staining cedar houses i don't have any of the ones that I did, but a lot of where i live you know in the kind of the woods there's a lot of uh a lot of cedar homes so um what i would do is take this really nasty chemical and strip it with a power washer and, and then reapply the stain um and i still have some like burn marks on my arms from that stuff it's like pretty nasty don't buy a cedar house there way too much work you have to do that like every five years too um and then i got into uh scrapping and this is our scrap truck dirty dan i got that for free actually um but <laughs> i was actually gonna scrap it and then uh and then i got it running so so where i live a lot of people like leave stuff like refrigerator not refrigerators that you can't scrap though that's illegal but they leave like washing machines and uh and ovens on the side of the road so i gotta pick it up and, like this like back when scrap prices were good like this would be like three four hundred dollar load so i figured out that you know like you know you could make a pretty good uh uh you know decent de decent living but at the expense of some some like physical movement the next day um it was like another day in the scrapping business another random body pain but uh um then i got into selling like i started to get into um uh, like industries around the town and, and um like throwing away these brand new electric motors that they would order wrong and i tried selling those but that kind of failed too because all the ones that were ordered wrong were like uh, median, like they were on 535 hertz or something like that. So uh, that didn't work out either. So I scrapped those. But uh, all these were kind of ghetto jobs. So, um, you know, uh, I figured that like I, I wanted to get a real job. So I worked at AutoZone and this like kind of sums up working at AutoZone. Uh, <laughs> all that happened. They made like crossbow one day. And, uh, we like knocked down a sign. It was pretty cool, but I, uh, I got some cashier experience. Um, that's always important.
but uh, I barely saw that. But yeah, and then I started buying more projects with all the money I was making. So uh, I bought this truck out in Montana and this old Mustang, and both of them I kind of are kind of on the back burner right now. Um, I used to have this truck here, but I burned the transmission on it, so it's in the shop right now. And then I got into snowmobiles. Um, but then I uh, I realized that this wasn't quite enough uh, projects to handle, so we decided to buy a used school bus um, <laughs> with my friends. Uh, so. And we just kind of like parked it in our yard and we uh, decided to turn it into a camper. So uh, that was uh, that was obviously a huge job. And we used it as a capstone project for senior class uh, in high school. So yeah, obviously we repainted it and we started redoing the inside because it was a Detroit school bus. And if you want to hear the story about where we bought the bus and like all the encounters we had that you have to ask me about that because that was pretty funny. But um, yeah, that was kind of the group that was involved in all of it. And then, um, uh, we unfortunately lost one of our friends, uh, Lucas, and uh, I guess we never realized like how much he kind of held the friend group together because like they kind of like dispersed after that, and so the bus project kind of got put on put on halt for a while, and it kind of sat in our yard. Um, and uh, by that time it was like start like to kind of focus on getting into colleges. So uh, I applied to all of these ones, and um, you know all in-state colleges because that was I never afford uh, out of state. So. Yeah, I even applied to MSU, you know, it's that evil one down there in the right, but uh, I didn't have a Michigan uh, letter come in, and then I realized that there's this thing called email, and you have to check it, and then I, like, uh, <laughs> I figured out, like, two months later that I got, uh, I got accepted into Michigan. I got deferred, of course, but uh, I got in, and I was like, wow, this is really cool, because um, when I did the orientation that they have, or the tour, you know, everybody else who was in my group, yeah, they were deciding between like Michigan and like Ivy League schools, and I was deciding between. No offense, like these are all good schools, but I was deciding between all in state. I was like, wow, Michigan you know, really holds weight. So I, I chose to go Michigan, and uh, so this is like an accurate uh, uh, diagram of Engine One Ten back in freshman year. They had these seminars every Tuesday, and uh, Professor Mackey uh, presented this awesome, uh, or gave this awesome presentation on name. And I remember, wait a minute, I like boats. Light bulb go off. So I made my way up to the name building um, on North Campus, and I talked to Warren. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he didn't even have to talk to me though. He just gave me the suffering. I was like, "Wow, this is so cool. I have to be there." So um, yeah, I declared name. That was the best decision ever. Um, uh, great group that you know I'm involved in. So you know everything that you know I've kind of done within the name department. You guys have all gone through. So I won't talk too much on that, but. Now I'll get into uh, uh, a little bit in-depth on some cool projects I've worked on uh, for my internships. And this one, this is kind of similar to the one that I gave last semester. So anybody who saw that at that one night, like now's your time to take the bathroom break, but come back because uh, <laughs> I have cool summer and stuff after it. So, um, so this is my summer internship at uh, Frank and Terry Marinette Marine. And uh, so, yeah, this obviously is... Uh, Wisconsin in July. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I went up there in February just to check it out. And I mean, they said it does look like that in pretty much the other eight months of winter that they have up there. So, but uh, we have a company history, um, the whole location up there in Marinette, Wisconsin, down here. This isn't really accurate map, but uh, uh, this, uh, they used to be a ton of like lumber companies on the Romney River. And um, but I that industry had kind of uh, dried up. And, uh, you know, some uh, Marinette Marine was found, they figured, hey, we have all this wood here, we have all this water here, let's build boats. Um, so they started building these uh, Great Lakes fish tugs, and uh, I'll take a picture of one of those later. Um, they're, they're, they're really neat kind of little uh, boats, and they, they're powered, they were first powered by those Kallenberg uh, diesel engines made in Two Rivers, Wisconsin, I think. Um, really interesting vessels. Um, but then they, they started to grow and uh, build other vessels, as you can see down here. Um, and they got purchased by multiple companies, and now they're owned by Pink and Terry. Uh, you know, they're kind of a shipbuilding giant overseas. They're the biggest com shipbuilding company in Europe and like the sixth worldwide, I think. Um, they're like the lead builder of cruise ships, period. Um, but, you know, why they had interest in the Wisconsin area is, pretty, is you know, beyond me, but it's interesting because they bought uh, Internet Marine Base Shipbuilding and Ace Marine, and they're all in the Green Bay area. And um, since then, they've improved the shipyard uh, facilities like quite a lot. Uh, they definitely know what they're doing in terms of uh, new facilities. So just kind of interesting. Oh yeah, 
all these docks here, this, this used to be a really uh, big hub for like coal and lumber transportation. So you'd have these uh, Ann Arbor railroad cars, uh, railroad car ferries. They'd load the train cars on them and take them across Lake Michigan to wherever. But I just thought it was cool as the Ann Arbor Railroad Company. But uh, yeah, the current projects that Marina Marine is working on, obviously they have um, the uh, guided missile frigate, which they just cut steel on uh, August 31st. So we're officially building a new class of frigate now. Um, the, and in the multi-mission service combatant and uh, LCS, and I'll talk about each of those in detail. So uh, yeah, you guys can read all this, um, but no, I'm just kidding. I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit. Um, LCS is not known as the Navy's most reliable ship. Uh, you guys may have heard it. Um, it's, a fun, it's fun to talk about. Uh, so basically the, the Navy kind of wanted a overstep hot rod of a truck that they could module, like put modular weapons on it and you know they could go into littoral combat like areas, applications and shoot off a bunch of modular weapon zones and uh, get out of there fast. So it's got to have a lot of engines and you got these two big, uh, uh, Rolls Royce MT30 gas turbines, the biggest marine gas turbines ever put on a ship um, for marine applications. Uh, I forgot which plane has them. Um, they're, they're, they're monsters. And it's got two uh, uh, V16 uh, um, Fairbanks Morse uh, diesel engines. Um, and yeah, these are 36 megawatts, which is like about 50,000 horsepower. And this is uh, and uh, it's also going to have uh, a bunch of, uh, I think it's out of Prashini generators for uh, power or, um, power generation. So this whole thing, right, this, I mean, this like engines all the way, like these outtakes here, these are for the generators because um, they just ran out of outtake and uptake space uh, or uptake and intake space for the, uh, throughout the uh, superstructure. So they start having to go out the side, which is crazy. But um, the, the main problem with this ship is this right here, this scary stuff. Um, which basically you have, like when you're in diesel mode, you have your pinion, your reduction gear, and you just, dis you disengage this clutch and this clutch. And, you know, that's fine. It works like how a usual reduction gear diesel system goes, but when it starts to get spooky is when you engage the gas, this clutch and disengage this one, which this is, this is the, well, this isn't really accurate, but this is supposed to be a bigger gear turning a smaller gear. So it's a, like a D reduction gear which has never been done on a ship, like no ship known to man has a deer reduction gear to like match the gas turbine speed. So um, yeah, it's, it's not built for this high speed application. The first two I think had their like Babbitt journal bearings and, and those ones I think were fine, but then the, yeah. the gearbox is forward. For some reason they ran out of those and they use roller bearings and how do roller bearings fail? Uh, catastrophically, they've turned into shrapnel. So that's obviously not good to have inside the gearbox. So. And that would happen after like 1500 hours of operation. So it like explode, like, cause they, so they'd make it past builder's trials and then they'd explode out in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> so so it, was, it was not a good sight to have ships being towed in with like black smoke out of the, out of the uh, uptakes, uh, you know, you know, for all the countries to see. So that was the biggest Achilles heel of this LCS. Supposedly they, they went back to uh, journal bearings uh, uh, for LCS 21 and forward. Um, but uh, there was talk about like decommissioning all of them. This is just a crazy mess. But uh, and that's not the only problem either. They have like these hydraulic hoses behold behind the below the water line. That's a no no because they load and spill hydraulic oil everywhere. That happened in Lake Michigan actually. Um, but they they like hired the local diver to like drive his Chris Craft yacht into the rib stowage and like dive down there and fix it himself with like I don't know, duct tape or something. Just crazy stories like that. Um, also, it's not the most survivable. Um, the hull can be punctured by its own diesel generator cylinders uh, shooting through the piston head. So, uh, <laughs> so, then, so um, if you can't take that, you're probably not going to be able to take, uh, take a, you know, anything larger like a missile. Also, the superstructure of aluminum, aluminum gets hot enough, it gets flammable. And speaking of aluminum, uh, the other variant of the LCS is not much better because it's all aluminum. And when you build a 400-foot trimaran of aluminum, you're gonna have some bendy problems. So uh, I've heard that that ship can't go like over C state four now. So C state three or something crazy like that. But the whole LCS project is a political mess. But uh, so, I don't know it's it's just fun to hear all the stories about it. But um, <laughs> my, my work with LCS, I didn't do a whole lot with it with it. So that's why I don't know too much about it about the ship. But um, they uh, I I've kind of like 
uh, they let this they let the ship sit pure side like I think it was like 25 like so long that the um, the reduction gear lube oil pipes had corroded so they um let me try to find different companies to find pickling solutions where you shoot chemical through and see if you can uh, kind of restore the chemical. And I was never able to get a hold of that company, so they ended up just replacing the pipes. Um, I did some inspections, nothing special really. So I didn't do too much work with LCS, but uh, so the other project that they have going on right now is a multi mission service combatant. And I'm sure they've started modular construction on this by now. Um, but they're building four of them, as far as I'm concerned, um, for the Royal Saudi Naval Forces. Um, and uh, it's kind of uh, different than the LCS. They don't have a rib store. I don't know what they put back there. Um, and there's like no chime line if you like look at a 3, 3D model of it. So it's it's not going to turn very well, but supposedly the Saudis just want to park one each entrance uh, to the, the Red Sea and use them as like deterrent. But who knows what they want with that. But basically what I would do is just uh, what they had me doing for that was just write waterfront test procedure, waterfront test procedures. And um, some of them were just copied over from LCS, but some of them had to be written from scratch, like like the seawater cooling bells for the the ship service diesel generators. Um, they had a they can't just or they figured that like having a flange uh, bolted directly to a diesel engine was not such a good idea for shock applications, so they put a bellows in between that. So I had to write a test procedure on like how to stretch the bellows and how to um, like take measurements of it, make sure it's not cracking apart and stuff. So before I talk about the constellation, uh, we'll talk about the the parent design and uh which is the friend frigate the which stands it's like something you're uh in italian it's like for something multi-purpose frigate european or something like that but i don't know i, I don't i don't I, i'm not going to try to butcher the, how they pronounce it but it's a family of multi-purpose uh frigates and i think they have the bergamini variant is the italian variant and um they have a french variant and that one's like a combined diesel electric or gas turbine system but i'm not going to talk about that this the one that the constellation based off is code like diesel, electric, and gas propulsion. And as you can see here, this is a lot less complicated than what you just saw here. So, like now you got only four diesel generators, and uh, they're hooked up to uh, these. Obviously, it's got to go through converters and transformers and variable frequency drives. And then you got these two big uh, electric propulsion motors, and that's for when you're doing silent running. And oh, sorry. And, and it powers this uh, auxiliary propulsion unit. Um, and then if you want to sprint, you uh, fire up this gas turbine and clutch it in, and um, you can have the combined diesel electric motors and the gas turbine helping you uh, propel you through the water. So it's um, it, this technology has been tried before and it's pretty successful. So that's what the Navy opted for. Um, you know, the predecessor uh, to the uh, Constellation was the Hazard or the Perry class frigates and they, um, they just had two gas turbines hooked up to one shaft. So really interesting to see how, how much different the new frigate design is like uh, compare, in comparison. But um, so obviously there's a few differences with how Constellation adopted the whole plan. There's obviously no bulbous uh, bow and therefore no sonar dome. So, and they, they opted to get rid of uh, uh, variable pitch propellers too. And they, had, they just have fixed pitch propellers, which makes me think they really want to stay quiet so they can hear like, and you know for acoustic reasons because they they probably would have a nice toad sonar rate um which is supposed to be better than a bulbous bow on surface ships um but uh yeah it's it's uh designed by pink and terry and gibbs and cox um lcs was designed completely by uh lockheed martin and contracted through pink and terry for engineering support and construction so um yeah i don't think lockheed martin's allowed to design ships anymore after that so uh that's uh <laughs> that's um I think that's why they're not let they kind of like left them out of the contract with with this so but uh obviously this is different um the, the Pearlson um I don't know if you remember at the banquet last year the CEO of uh, Pearlson Shiplifts um was visited but the people who are making this ship lift here um are uh building uh the Pearlson ship lift here and um I think uh I don't know when, it, when it'll be ready but before like yeah, they would side launch ships but now that like when I was up there, they were like exploding the bottom of the Menominee River with dynamite to make room for this. So it was like pretty violent. But um, you want to see like why they're doing this? Obviously, I can find the video of uh, this. Is, this is actually funny. Or not funny, but um, what you should not do. Yeah, we're, oh, I already looked it up before. All right. It's not going to be on YouTube. I keep taking it off YouTube. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so this is what they used to do before. And this is a NOAA ship. 
They're launching it with uh, the uh, the LCS cradle, so the ship's too small for it. And it kind of slips out of the cradle and shoots logs back into the audience. So that's obviously not a good thing. But yeah, so that's obviously if they, Look, that, that cradle that they use is not a multi-purpose cradle or anymore. So that's why we're having this nice ship lift to set it down nicely and not, not cause super, a lot of damage like that. So, but uh, yeah, so I, my work with FFG is mostly like design, um, maybe some part matrices for you know various piping systems, um, master equipment list. This is all like typical engineering stuff. Oh, the frigate's gonna be the first uh, Navy ship that has anti-biofouling and like treatment control in there and like ballast water treatment system. So the Navy's starting to be environmentally conscious. So that's pretty good news. Um, and then like it was a rite of passage to correct some Gibbs and Cox uh, out of there. You know, like, they tried to submit a drawing that had like all copper nickel pipe for a fuel oil system, which I, I found out that's a bad thing because you will clog your injectors because the fuel oil will polymerize inside the pipes and you could potentially ruin your diesel. So. Um, Gibbs and Cox tended to make a lot of mistakes uh, with their drawings, so they had to have a lot of people like catching them. So, but um, <laughs> so yeah, I know there's. I mean, there's. I could talk about a lot of this stuff, but I kind of want to get to the, the second internship. Um, you want to talk to me about this like firefighting system they have, whatever. And I don't want to like follow up the, the firefighting presentation with another one. So uh, from last week, so I, I can't be as good as that. But uh, the company culture there was definitely weird. Um, they love photo shops. Um, they like they seem fascinated that my name is Jackson, so they always made like Jackson photo shops. I like this one, he like recorded it for fishing. Um, <laughs> there's a guy named Brian, but they put his name tag wrong, so we just called him Brain from there. On. I forgot the context of that, but I think I took that picture. Um, I'm not sure what's going on there, but like on the most serious side, like I got to meet Mark Vandroff, and uh, he gave me the challenge coin for the uh, LCS 27 USS Nantucket. Um, that was pretty cool. Um, I kind of liked it there. Um, but you have to really like the outdoors, um, which is, uh, so I eventually finished the uh, school bus when I got this internship with my dad, or finished it, it'll never be done. Um, that's kind of what it looks like on the inside. I'll, I have better pictures of the inside if you guys want to see, but so I was like right here at this campground and I literally had to just drive across this bridge and then go around here to the shipyard. It was a seven minute drive. So but that was pretty awesome. And uh, oh, I also bought a boat in Green Bay, uh, the 1961 Starcraft uh, 15 footer with a 28 horse Evinrude uh, on it from 1964. So I definitely had the oldest boat on the river, but I just cruise up and down here. Sometimes I'd anchor off the beach here and go swimming because the parking here was crazy, but that was a lot of fun. Um, I went boating like every other night. Sometimes I'd get like Chinese food from uh, uh, this, I forgot where it is. Uh, what's that place called? Number one Chinese, yeah. No, I get like I get like ten crab rangoons and like take them out in the boat and eat them. I could eat like seven of them before I get sick, but that's not. Like, but that's uh, <laughs> like oh boy, I think I'm on the last one. But um, so yeah, that you know, like if you do, if you um find stuff to do, you like it. Like you really do have to like the outdoors uh to to uh like the area. So. Obviously, I wouldn't have a scuba dive there. Um, the guy who taught the scuba diving class was like, he did it out of a shack built onto his house. Um, and that was the guy who drove his Chris Graff yacht into the group storage of the LCS. And he had this super dated equipment from like the 80s and 90s. Like the colors were insane, like like Polaris purple and like pink diving outfits. It was like, it was crazy. But this is one of those fish tugs I was talking about. This one looks like it's steel, but I think someone was living in it. Like, so I was like, that's pretty cool. That's cooler than the school bus. They're just living in that boat. <laughs> I saw like flower pots and stuff and like some uh, on, it and, on it all the time. But there's always something going on in the river. Like I saw this big uh, freighter come by. Like I didn't, I wasn't even planning it. But I was just like going down the Manana River and there's a big freighter called the Algoma Buffalo. And uh, it was just like leaving the foundry. I was like, wow, that's cool. So I got a bunch of pictures of that. And they're always towing LCSs back and forth because they're always have issues but uh oh yeah kind of more activities there's a lot of cool maritime museums i went up to picture rocks beautiful up there I recommend it a lot of waterfalls up there in marinette county um there's bowling 
Um, <laughs> the Badger was cool. I took the Badger like two or three times to go back home because it was it saved it actually saved money and gas than to drive all the way back to the UP to go home. So I would just uh, I would leave my car at uh, at the parking lot here, and then I would take the Badger across. You you could take your car on this the boat, but I didn't do that. I just had my parents pick me up. I was done driving at that point. Oh yeah, here's the ship. This is what a ship launch done right looks like. Um, so uh, I don't know if there's sound. Oh, there we go. For the United States of America, I personally am tired. May God bless all who sail on her forever. Amen. She's up there in the, yeah, there it goes. It is quite impressive, like how it just splashes and it's, it's really cool to see from the other side too. But it, you can see the tugboats in the background kind of grunting, like keeping it in place. It's, it's really cool to watch. Yeah, it was, uh, that was definitely the highlight of the summer. But uh, yeah, it's a pretty, uh, how do you get out of it? No, I don't want to watch it again. Um, okay, there we go. Sorry. Um, no, I'm not, I'm not really okay. okay, here's a question break. If you guys have any questions, but only take a minute because if you want to get to some submarine stuff, uh, you got to keep moving. <laughs> any questions about Marinette Marine? Okay, so yeah, what next? Okay, so I hit the jackpot somehow and I got seven internship offers last uh, last winter. And I don't know what I did. I guess they just really liked me in the interviews, but I'm counting these two as, as separate. So um, that doesn't necessarily know. But, um, you know, all of these were kind of uh, yards except for Carter Rock, but I got this offer before I got this one and they were like, you only have three days to accept this. So I was like, all right, man, submarines are kind of cool. I didn't know what the heck. I was like, what's a momentum? You know, I didn't even know, like, momentum. What in the, so I took the offer, and then I got the, you know, the award offer from them, like, right after. But, you know, whatever. Because um, I made a good choice because um, eventually ended up at, so I don't know what I did. I ended up at a momentum, and uh, honestly, it was a pretty good decision. If you want to decipher this, you can. I, I'll send it to you. I really don't know. Like, they're comprised of a lot of different companies that kind of uh, have been around for a long time. Like this is what, 1900. So uh, they do have a lot of history. They're, they are a defense contractor, but they also do work with like uh, Department of Energy and everything. So kind of like uh, Lockheed Martin in a way they have their, they have people in, you know, aerospace and, uh, you know, naval, naval applications and everything. So in ground, ground support. So, yeah, so I was, a. Uh, uh, in Team Submarine, and this is kind of like a breakdown of Team Submarine. Um, so you have like the program executive offices in the Navy Yard. Um, you have like the strategic ones, which is, uh, you know, the boomers, the ballistic missile submarines. Um, and, you know, you can see all the different project offices in here. The one that I got put in was SSNX, the next generation of tax submarine. I'll get into that later. But I don't know, this is pretty cool. If you just look up Team Submarine org chart, you can find it online um, just to see like just how. Uh, the, the top of the decision making brain right? like, like this is where all the major decisions get made with in terms of design acquisition procurement um and maintenance of all submarines uh it has to start here so i was like all right this this is pretty cool i ended up kind of at hq um and i got put in the next generation tech submarine project office uh, ssnx project office and don't like this is the only picture i can find of it but disregard this we're not going to have a like, I don't think, I think we're done having submarines with like fair water planes. And this only has like two wide aperture arrays. So you can, there's like, I don't, I don't know what the point of this picture was, but um, this part is from a congressional report. You can look it up online and it's SSNX. They want it to have, have, they want it to have all the good stuff from each submarine class before. So they want like the huge payload from uh, Seawolf, which, you know, the eight torpedo tubes and like 50 torpedoes. It's something insane like that, but they want the quietness of uh, Virginia class and the availability uh, and service life of uh, Columbia class, which um, Columbia class is designed for the reactor to last its entire lifetime. So um, 
kind of the breakdown. This was like as as uh, in depth as they let me get it because um, the actual org chart for the SSNX project office is classified. But they let me they let me make this one for uh, the internship presentation. This is all unclassified, but there are more people in it. But it's still a pretty small, growing project office. But thank God I got put in the concept design branch because like my the hair in the back of my neck stood up whenever I heard uh, like digital engineering or model based systems engineering. I didn't like that whenever like I'd have to go to a meeting for that because they'd show like a their model and it's just like this is a model for air compression air compression system and it was like a just a box like with a line drawn to another box and they click run and nothing happens and they're like see there's the model so i don't know I, I didn't know. <laughs> it was pretty uh it's pretty interesting but, you know we're trying to push that kind of uh all digital new ship uh design with with our, our next generation uh naval ships and i heard ddgx is a little bit farther along with the adaption of an all digital uh, ship because before i mean we uh, well, I'll just get into it in this next slide here. Um, like we have to, you know, push these uncertain technologies, and as you can see here, like uh, Columbia and Seawolf, they really I put Seawolf if I if this had any metric to it, I put like Seawolf like a lot higher than Columbia because you know during the Cold War we wanted you know the most capable submarine ever, so we like pushed a lot of uncertain technologies while we were building the uh, this class of submarines. So a lot of things were unsure as we were getting built, but that also forced um, uh, a lot of capabilities into the submarine. You know, Columbia, and you know, if you can, if you want to look it up, like what Seawolf did that was so revolutionary, you can look it up. I, um, in Columbia, you know, it's, it's, it's pushing some stuff that's like, you know, the turboelectric propulsion that's been done before on the uh, USS Tullaby and Gunner P. Lipscomb. That's unclassified, so you can look those, but they weren't successful, so it's going to be done in Columbia now. Um, Virginia is like down here because like Virginia was was procured when the cold when the Berlin Wall came down. We're like and Congress said no to expensive seawolf submarines, so we had to build uh, we had to find a budget uh, submarine pretty quickly. So we used a lot of technologies that were already available to us and uh, like a lot of commercial off the shelf uh, equipment. Um, so and and the fact that we're still building Virginia, we've kind of pushed it past its capability. Like we were make like Block Five, you know, we stretched the submarine um and lengthened it by like what 90 feet or whatever and, and so at the, to the point where it can't turn so th there's a reason why we need a new class of submarine when we need to design for these uh future capabilities um uh in the future and that's where ssnx is right now so it's like and also the requirements are kind of um undecided to or uncertain because the congress is like very vague about what they want still but it's, it's a very early project office it's kind of cool to see the a new class of ship and its infant steps, but uh, I'm not sure why FFGX is on here. That's that constellation, um, but it's kind of a good coincidence because uh, I, uh, you know, I had worked with FFGX, but obviously it's like way down here in known technologies because they literally just copy and paste the Italian for it. So, but um, so yeah, I, I did a lot of cool stuff that I can't talk about, unfortunately, but I can be vague about it and say this stuff. Um, so like I, basically, I was just you know. Uh, look at these concept designs delivered by the shipbuilders. Um, shipbuilders meaning Electric Boat and Newport News. They would they would produce all the concept designs. Hardly any concept designs got actually produced in the Navy Yard except by O5U6, which is the um, Future Submarines Project Office. But their designs were just kind of like to make sure that we weren't missing anything. Like the actual designs were being put out by Electric Boat and NNS. So I had to find uh, meaningful trends between these. Uh, Concepts and unfortunately, like the differences that make these like uh, data points different. Oh, here we go. There's a buzzword. I'll say that for later. Um, but uh, the 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 thing that made these differences like really like I can't talk about it. Also, it's kind of frustrating. I wish I could you know tell you guys, but um, uh, basically, uh, it was it was wanted to look at outliers and make sure um, you know do what what's causing this outlier, whether it be like a a different type of, uh, I'm not even going to say it, but what, what would be causing these outliers and the cause of that? Do we want to eliminate that or do we want to explore that, uh, you know, design uh, those parameters uh, more? So that's where set-based design was a huge buzzword. The uh, the ship design manager, not the concept design manager, was a PhD student from U of M. He did his PhD with uh, Singer. So we heard a lot of set-based design uh, <laughs> down there. That was like, 
that it was almost uh it was almost unbearable but uh, <laughs> But you guys, you know, obviously a lot of you guys will know or do know how set-based design works now. Um, if you don't, you will. So I won't spend too much time explaining it. But like, so like, we'll say like this specialty here is maybe like the insane amount of weapons that Seawolf has. And this specialty is design life cycle. You know, what can we do to kind of converge these trade spaces uh, to get the obviously the best submarine? And this takes a long time. And that's what set-based design does. But that's how you design a submarine that doesn't um that like so you're not stretching the submarine to the point where it can't turn um so we got to think ahead when we're uh designing submarines and also i got to do work for carter rock um so i don't know if you guys have ever seen like a ship or a submarine before the waterline but they get furry really quickly with like this, i mean the seaweed's like this long it really looks like like a gilly seaweed it's uh pretty crazy so that obviously affects uh drag uh, it can uh, impact, you know, design full speed and everything. Um, and uh, it's also difficult to, uh, you know, clean very easily when you're between patrols. So a lot of the growth gets super bad, like like coral and, you know, and a lot of nasty stuff. And there's a way to rate all this for, you know, the computational uh, fluid dynamics uh, database. So like, you know, seaweed's like down at one of the lower ones, but once you get all the way up to like hard growth, um, it's like a number like 10 or whatever. But uh, basically, you can scale those values to a certain grit of sandpaper for model testing, which I thought was really cool. So you can you can design a submarine to um, kind of have uh, this design margin uh, for marine growth. And that's kind of what I, I put in a lot of data from submarines that were out in the, uh, uh, you know, out on patrol and the divers. I got to read a lot of diver reports and um, Kind of make a database for coming to uh, for the CFD team. So that was really cool. Um, and not only is growth a uh, problem, but uh, you know, the whole coding on Virginia glasses got issues. It's um, it's it's feeling like an onion, and that's obviously not a good place because this anechoic coding it mitigates you know outgoing engine you know, turbine noise, and it also you know helps keep you uh, undetectable for, or at least somewhat undetectable from active sonar because um, you know if you got this bare metal showing like you know you're uh, active sonar will definitely be able to pick that up or bounce off that. So, um, and it's also bad for drag too. It causes a lot of dis uh, disturbed flow, and it's really bad if the if like this flap here is like flapping and like banging on the side of the hole because that will really let people know uh, where you are. So, um, so maybe I kind of did the same thing with that. I kind of made a database for that, um, and uh, you know, discuss preventative methods. And I don't want to get too much into that, but. Uh, that, this is all, you know, kind of uh, the SSNX like future design efforts, you know, like what kind of coatings do we want to use in the future and stuff. So, yeah, but uh, that's kind of all I did for work. I did get to go on a lot of trips. I went to the Naval Foundry and Propeller Center in Philadelphia. These are all on their website, so don't worry about any of these. But uh, I guess the one fact, it's like the non largest non ferrous casting capabilities in the nation. So it's pretty cool. I got to see a pour. Um, and they make, you know, they make... Uh, Propellers and propulsors for stuff. So I don't want to say that. Oh, and I got to go to uh, Newport News and uh, Norfolk Naval. Got to get on a submarine. Um, this is USS Washington. Um, very cool. Um, very cramped. Uh, and I also got to go on a. This isn't. This is the Enterprise. And uh, does anybody know what's special about the Enterprise? Particular carrier. Yeah. Yeah. So I, we didn't get to go on that because it was like getting like totally torn apart. But uh, I got to go on the USS John. F. Kennedy, which is the, the second Ford class aircraft carrier. And I didn't really get to see much on that. And I couldn't take pictures of that, but I got pictures of these the submarines. So that was really cool. That was definitely a highlight of the trip. Uh, I also got to go to Naval War Undersea Warfare Center in Rhode Island. Um, and basically, we went to like an eight hour long meeting. So that was really boring. And it was basically all these buzzwords trade space reduction and, and uh, key ship characteristics, blah, blah, blah. Not much really got done there, but at least we all got to see each other. <laughs> um it could have been done on like zoom or no they use they use this like jank version of uh microsoft teams called uh flank speed but every call it jank speed <laughs> so yeah but um and then we got to go to tour of their facilities you know we got to look through a la class periscope and you know look through people's windows because it was like sticking through the top of the building you could zoom in and like see people's houses and stuff so that was cool <laughs> Um, got to see the UUV lab. Uh, can't really talk about that. Um, 
or that, but I can say that I got to see it, but uh, uh, vertical line system, torpedo tube test facility, those are pretty cool. Um, they do they do everything with like uh, submarines there. So definitely uh, worth checking out if you're interested in submarine work. I mean, it's, it's a pretty good variety that they have there and it's in a decent-ish area. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I got to, oh, I got to go to the Pentagon too. And uh, that's me, politician Jackson. That's me proposing an all LCS Navy. Um, <laughs> they had this little uh, booth set up, like right when we walked in or whatever. It was cool in there, but like, honestly, you could spend weeks in there. It's like a museum and a workspace. Like all the hallways have like really cool, um, like artifacts and uh, um, plaques and stuff. And I don't know, I thought all that stuff was kind of cool. Um, and they had like a memorial for the the 9-11 section and they they had uh kind of like graves set in like where the, in the direction that the plane crashes kind of sobering to see all that so but uh, definitely very cool i got to go on a lot of trips uh oh and the way that momentum worked like uh, even though i was getting the paycheck from momentum i didn't really work for momentum at all i worked for directly for team submarine um and uh they Basically, as per Momentum's contract, they have to find 24 interns to put into Team Submarine, and uh, because the, the Washington Navy Yard won't do it themselves, so um, so Momentum gets a certain stipend for interns, and uh, as per their contract with the Navy Yard, so that's it's really weird and bureaucratic, um, but it allows us to get paid a lot and, and also to go on these cool trips. So that's the cool part. And uh, oh yeah, I stayed in the bus again. I stayed in College Park, Maryland. Um, this is about a, like a 50 minute commute uh, by Metro into DC. And this campground was insane. It had like two swimming pools and uh, uh, like a restaurant and gated access. And it was expensive, but I mean, it'd be like a shoebox apartment in DC. And I had my own yard. I mean, it wasn't much of a campsite, but I gotta, gotta use the bus uh, as much as I can, right? And then, uh, oh yeah, free time, we did a lot of stuff. We, oh yeah, there was a mini golf course at the campground. Everybody uh, came over for that. We had a barbecue. That was fun. So a lot of museum ships. Uh, uh, the Constellation, uh, not the OG Constellation, but the uh, it's not a frigate, but it's a what is it called? I don't know what it was called. I forgot what type of ship it was. It was like a frigate, but with one less deck than a frigate for back then. Um, I got to see the USS New Jersey. The huge guns, but obviously, I mean, I can't tell which guns are bigger, you know. <laughs> and then uh oh yeah we saw the the olympia that's the oldest steel hold warship still afloat awesome thing one of my favorite ships ever i'm building a model of it right now actually um and uh there's a i forgot is this the torsk or the or current something like there's some kind of weird fish name. this is a uh i should have cropped that is that in baltimore jackson uh no this was in philadelphia philadelphia i think it's Bakura, right yeah Bakuna. Okay, yeah, it's a it a World War II submarine that was part of the Guppy program, the Greater Underwater Propulsion Program. Basically, where they would take a submarine from and streamline it to like make it go faster and add some cool stuff to it. But yeah, th these are all cool. Um, definitely got on a lot of ships this summer. Um, you know, decommissioned or museum ships or you know, in commission ships. So that's cool. Uh, oh, I guess I don't have another slide, but I was going to see my future plans, but I don't really have any. So uh, we'll just go to straight to questions then. Uh, so. Uh, does anybody have any questions? I know you're all probably itching to get to work on all the work that we have to do right now. So. <laughs> if, if anybody doesn't have any questions. Yeah. Do you have a favorite ship that you've ever been on? Ever been on? Or a couple of the highlights? Um, I'd say the Olympia is one of the big, big ones. That submarine was cool. Uh, I didn't get to go on anything that I wanted to see, if you know what I mean. But because they did special training or something for that. But um, uh, the, the Washington and the Olympia for this summer, for sure. Those are my two favorites. I've been on a, an Iowa class battleship before. So oh, it's, it's, it's still awesome. But, you know, I've been on one before. And then um, favorite ship ever. Like, I've been on a lot of museum freighters here. So, but those are kind of uncomparable. So, I don't know. I like all ships. <laughs> yeah. If you were to redesign the LCS, <laughs> add any feature you wanted, and it, it would work as well. The whole ship would work. Ooh. What would you want to add? Uh, make it go, go gag, combine gas and gas turbines. See how fast we can get it to go, man. <laughs> <laughs> 60 knots. 
fuel is, you know, if, if there, if like fuel was unlimited, which I hear like the current LCS has a problem with like, I'm talking like making it a few laps around like Michigan before you run out of fuel. Like that's like, that's an issue. I don't know. Um, if fuel was unlimited, I, I would make it way faster. That's for sure. Well, I would not have clutches inside the gearbox. That's a no-no. And I would not use uh, roller bearings now. now. Now that I know that how they uh, fail. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's my uh, signal to be done. <laughs> Any other questions? I didn't even, I probably touched them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean,